Why, hello, everybody. We were just welcome to your sounds. Welcome to D&D Time Talks. We discuss all things Dungeons and Dragons. We don't do creepy laughs right before we go on camera on this show. I'm Pete. I'm Jeremy. Hey, um, everyone. Jeremy, we got so everyone's sad. hanging out right. Oh, I'm, I was just timid because you called me out hardcore. Just a second ago. No oh. one knew, but now everyone knows. Now because. everyone knows. Well, I was really thinking was about your doing fault it. For calling oh. me that. Well, I was thinking about doing a creepy mm. laugh, which is kind of like uh, mm. which is kind of like doing one if this were minority report. But I see lots of people in chat. Uh I got Flannel Pug, we got Maddie Borgs, we got Bionic Shiva, we got Shogun Turtle, we got Farku. Uh, more Opal Dragon, more people probably farther up on the chat that I can no longer see. The Forgotten wow. One. Wow. Wow. Pete. We got Trust a Flump. Is that what you mean? Yeah. That's okay, I'm sorry. Different. How are you doing, everyone? I'm doing great this evening. I don't know why, but I'm filled with life and energy and excitement <laughs> that I'm not usually filled with. Really? <laughs> Jeremy, no, I'm always filled with you excitement. You exude right? it. You exude life and excitement in everything that you do. Yeah. That's all I got. Uh, yeah, no, today we're going to be talking... <laughs> work has been soul training. Um, I'm sorry. Well, allow your soul to be refilled as we discuss improvisation. Uh, specifically, improvisation in the rest of the aspects. Last time we were talking about combat, but today we're going to be talking about... Uh, more of like the storytelling, role playing, exploration phases of the game, and how to uh, how to best improvise in those sort of settings. Uh, so, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free. Uh, not only really feel free, feel obligated. Please do uh, pipe up and chat and let us know what you think uh, as we go through. Yeah, and uh, you know, as always, these what we're going to talk about here. These are what Pete and I have learned from our experience. What worked for us may not necessarily work for you. You know your players at your table better than anyone else is gonna. So when you sit down and you go to play, do what you think is right is really what it comes down to. Take our advice to heart. But if something we do doesn't work, throw it out. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, forgot once the tonight's talk is about winging it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Bionic Sheba has given the number one rule of improvisation, which is to lie your ass, ass off. It was just planned all along. Uh, absolutely, that is actually the best advice you could have about improvisation, is to never admit that you are improvising at any given time. You know, that's, well, I could see it both ways. You know, I, I think post I see it both ways. <clears throat> I see it both ways. You know, there's like, it's, there's an impressiveness to, holy shit, you're just making this all up on the fly. And there's also an impressiveness to, like, keeping it all behind the curtain where the players have no idea how much stuff you just pulled out of your butt. Uh, but anywho, yeah, I think this is a super cool topic. I'm really excited about this one. I am as well. Um, if this is something all Dungeon Masters do, Flannel Pug, I'm so sorry I stole your energy, bud. But you know what? You're awake this time. You're not going to fall asleep to the soothing sounds of my voice. Just lay, lay, lay down and close your eyes and relax. And... Oh, anyway, God, Jerry. Please don't do this It's in my head. It's in my I'm head. Hurt feet now. Uh, yeah, no, this is, a great, this is a great topic. Improvisation. Yeah, it's good, good stuff. Um, I don't know. We don't need to talk about why we're talking about it. It's obvious. Everyone's had that time. You've got this great dungeon planned. You're super excited, and your players don't go into the forest. And you're like, "Shit, how are they gonna find my dungeon? It's in Just, the forest. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. Everything is at the wall. What's Everything is on? impossible now. They're hanging out in the tavern. Just they just won't leave. Uh, and you need to figure out what to do. Well, this is uh, a great, uh, a, an important tool and ability that you need to have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this also topic. Player, but... Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say this topic is like we we're just gonna say. I think Jeremy's pointing it out uh, that this is gonna be a DM focused topic. Uh, but I think more so than last time, where it was really just about running combat. Uh, this is gonna be a, a lot more player centric, as you know, improvisation tools are great if you just want to do stuff as a character. Uh, you know, these kind of storytelling things. It's great when you see players start to take storytelling into their own hands and, and kind of use this stuff in games too. So, Farquhar, I love your comment. Are you improving the talk about improvisation so meta? 
Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we are only half improvising our talk about improvisation. Uh, we have some very, <laughs> you know, key points that we have. We have some very key points that we have plotted out for ourselves over the course of this conversation that we want to get to, which brings me into the very first thing we want to talk about with improvisation, which is the key to good improvisation is Pete, to have good preparation. One, oh, shit. I was going to set you up with I'm this sorry. One secret will teach you the greatest key to improvisation. Doctors uh, hate him. This correct. one DM. Uh, yes, uh, the key to improvisation is actually preparation, in kind of my opinion. Uh, and that is not to say that you need to prepare for everything. And to refine that a little bit more, it's to say that you need to prepare intelligently. Uh, as the title of this episode you can see is Expecting the Unexpected. Uh, you need to think about what it is that your players are going to do and prepare uh, for the situations that you think their actions you know, might lead you into. Yeah, a, a lot of the time, especially as a DM, you'll get kind of carried away with some cool idea that you have in mind. Uh, and this can happen as a player, too, right? You'll get some cool idea of something you want to do, and the rest of the party just doesn't want to do it. Or in the DM case, your players just don't bite. You know, they meet the merchant with the quest hook of, ah, Kraken sank my ship, but if you will help me recover the treasure, I'll give you a quarter of it or half of it. And players are like, well, a Kraken, nah. Just we're level four, so. <laughs> and, you know... That happens, right? That happens all the time. You get all excited about this idea. You don't consider the fact that the fish might not bite. And oh, there yeah. are a lot of ways to kind of deal with that and to realize that's going to happen before it happens. Indeed. Uh, so the biggest thing to really focus on our first kind of talking point is think about your players and their characters' motivations, right? Because that's going to determine what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. Like, if you have... Um, well, I mean, yeah, what, what are their motivations, right? Biggest motivation? Power. Uh, a lot of players and characters are motivated by power alike. Uh, and, you know, that's true of players and characters. Yes. Uh, I know I know people who love playing D&D to feel powerful. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of the fantasy of the game. You're oh, yeah. a super magical person. Uh, and obviously characters, that's a huge drive for a ton of them. Um, so if you can think of like the different players and characters that you're playing with and what they are motivated by, if they're motivated by power, you can use the allure of power to kind of draw them in. And that can be gold, right? Maybe it's personal wealth or treasure. Uh, that can be like influence, right? It can be um, maybe this powerful merchant is established as an important local lord, and so big influence might be important to them as a character or as a player. Um, and obviously gear, magic items. Oh, yep. and there was also a, a Vorpal Sword in my wagon. Uh, and suddenly they're willing <laughs> to go and fight that Kraken for the Vorpal Sword because oh, yes. it's Vorpal Sword. Uh, uh, no, uh, I, I mean, even just... Uh, you could even just say that power could be experience. Like, they want to go... You know that they're going to want to fight things because they want to get experience points and level up. Like, that is even a completely valid thing to judge off a player. Um, an another great kind of motivator for players is recognition. Uh, the desire to be a hero. Just as people want to be powerful in D&D, they want to be heroes. That's, I, I think... You know, myself, that's a great part of the game, is this ability to be someone that you're not. To you know, show off these skills to accomplish great feats that you yourself would never realistically be able to accomplish, be it through, you know, magic, which does not exist, or, I'm sorry, for anyone who believes in magic, I take it back, magic, maybe it exists, or, um, or you know, if you want to be a great sword fighter and show off these, these prowesses, and just, you know, role-playing opportunities for players, um, getting to do the things that their characters are good at and that they want their characters to do. Characters to do. Uh, and it may not even be something that they're good at. Maybe it's a vice of theirs. Uh, maybe their character, you know, really loves gambling uh, and you describe a gambling den for them to walk by. Uh, 
knowing the kind of things that are going to get your characters excited to your players excited to role play their characters are another kind of great motivator for specifically players. I guess players more so than characters is what we're going to focus on here. Yeah, and the next one is kind of I think all encompassing. It's entertainment, right? It's like players are here to play the game, to have a good time usually. You know, that's what they they do. And so if you provide an option to them that you think will be entertaining, great. It really, the other parts don't even matter so much, like recognition or power. Those don't matter if the players don't care. It doesn't matter that one of your players is like, ah, I guess the lawful good paladin. That's the character that they've decided to play. <clears throat> and you put a situation where they can go be a hero if the player doesn't really care, right? Their character might be lawful, lawful good, but they're not interested, and if they're not interested in it, they're not going to bite. So it's really, all of these things are things to think about, but what really matters is what's going to entertain your players, because those are the things that they are going to actively pursue, especially if they have more than one scenario to choose from. The illusion of kind of always knowing where the players are going to is mm -hmm. uh, a stab, like, that's the key when you're DMing and you're trying to improv, it's you give them eight different options and you're ready for the one option they pick because you know which option they're going to pick. Exactly. Because you know your players. Um, and it's just taking the time to think about that. What's going to be the most fun for them? Because they're going to go for that. And another and probably the final and honestly probably the least common of them is uh, progression as a motivator. Just reaching each goal point, completing quests, checking things off the list, getting stuff done, following the DM story, because usually the DM does have a story, even if he's not, you know, uh, even if they're not forcing the players into him, odds are you have like a general overarching story in mind uh, that you hope to see the beats of play out at some point. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Just, it's rare to see those players. It's honestly, it's really nice when you have someone like that in your group, because that's the kind of player that keeps things on track and makes it a lot easier to improvise because they're kind of going to the points that you have set up. Uh, and, you know, there's never a guarantee that you're going to have someone like that in your particular group. I, I have a really interesting point coming in in chat here. Ivalon is asking, uh, at D&D time, what if the DM is half-assing the story? Uh, and then I think that's a selfie mode is half-assing his own thing. Uh, <laughs> that's totally fine. I mean, it, it is, but it isn't, right? What are the players? What are the players interested in? If the players just want to come at the table, sit down and play, you know, go out adventuring, fight some trolls in the forest, and come back and hang out and spend their money on cool magic items and like whatever they're interested in is what you need to cater, well, what you should try to cater to as a DM. Yep. Um, if they really just want to role play and they don't care about the overarching story, great. That's awesome. You, you don't have to worry about an overarching story. Just come up with cool NPCs that you think they'd enjoy role playing with and put them into the, the story, right? Have your half ass story and make them go from point A to point B because that's what they're interested in, right? If they love role playing, they're interested in interesting characters and use those characters as bait to kind of coerce them into going the right way. And if your players are having fun, then I wouldn't even say it was a half ass story. As long as people are enjoying yeah. themselves, then it's a great story, as far as I'm concerned, at least. Uh, and there's another cool comment from uh, Rye Guy Big Boy here. Good improv is like a good jazz solo, stretching the boundaries of the key and yet not making it atonal. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the, uh, the musical term atonal, just meaning without pitch and just nonsense. <laughs> yeah, precise. Jeremy, excellent example there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's being able to find these places where you can kind of push the limits and, you know, really sort of kind of shift it's almost like you're shifting the world around the player's actions while still keeping it in kind of the framework that you generally have in mind for it yeah i got we got a couple more questions coming in which i'm okay with just answering some questions for yeah myself. i'm totally fine about me yeah. we're gonna improv these answers real quick uh, uh, nice uh, uh whoa, whoa. Asking, what about retconning uh or going back to fill in stuff in hindsight and you know what that's a really great kind of point to add and I think, again, that kind of 
depends to a degree on your players, um, especially when it comes to retconning things. There are so many times uh, that I, as a dungeon master, forget something that I wanted to. Uh, maybe I forgot to introduce an NPC when the players came to a place um, that they went to visit. And I'm like, oh, crap, that was an important NPC I forgot to introduce. And there's, they've been there for like a week because we've been playing for a session and I just forgot the NPC existed. Oh, no. Um, and yeah, I mean, like in a situation like that, there's not a lot you can do. You can't really retcon them in, or if your players are cool with that kind of stuff, you can. You can just say, by the way, there was this character who was being quiet and staying to themselves, and you just kind of have been ignoring them for the most part. But today, they come to talk to you. Um, and it's an easy way to kind of deal with that. My personal experience is, if a player calls you out and say, are you retconning this? Or, oh, so we're retconning this. Be like, yeah, just be square with it, right? If, if you think it's mm -hmm. worth retconning. Um, I personally never like to retcon combat. Out of combat, you can retcon some stuff. In combat, I'm just not a big fan. Um, just because in combat as a dungeon master, your job is not to run a creature precisely as the monster manual says. Your job is to adjudicate combat and to create a dangerous scenario. And if the player, if a player dies because you misread a monster in the monster manual and you rolled four D10 instead of three for its damage and you killed the player, that's fine. That monster was scarier than the other. It may have been scarier because of your mistake, but committing to that is something that, you know, you can do. Now, if you're on that same turn and there's a little debate going on and you're like, oh crap, there's something I could have done maybe you know you can do something about that but i find that taking the time to fix those kind of things in combat can really take people out of the action so yeah, i guess absolutely. long long answer the short answer is just you know when you have to write con be square about it just deal with it um and i personally wouldn't write con in combat if uh, you don't need to uh oh I can't. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with Jeremy on the keeping combat consistent. Uh, you start to really lose like the stakes and the danger when players get the sense that like, well, if I make a mistake, we'll just you know we'll just figure it out and then I won't actually end up dying. Uh, you know that stuff. I 100% am with you on that, Jeremy. Uh, and I suppose on the rest of it as well. I also agree with if you have to retcon something in the story that you really wanted to get across, it's not too big of a deal. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the times you can find ways to make it work without retconning, right? Um, the Lord of the House, yeah, they were out. They were uh, at a meeting with some other local nobles. That's why you didn't meet the local noble. Uh -huh. uh, as uh, an example from my uh, from a game that I played the other day, uh, a player uh, players uh, we weren't sure whether or not I forgot to tell them or they forgot to get an important piece of information, which was the name of an individual at a place and no one could remember it. So in that moment, I just decided that one of the players, uh, I just had them roll a history check and whoever got the highest, I just had a scene come back where they, they remembered at this point in time, back when they were talking to this individual, and then I just like role played it like that character was there and they were still talking to them and let them ask the question like it happened at that time. And that worked really well. Uh, no one felt like they were, you know, completely drawn out of the scene. Uh, and, you know, they got the retcon piece of information that they needed for the, you know, the action that they were wanting to do in the story to progress. Um, there's tons of stuff that you can, creative ways you can start to work stuff back in if you forget it. Ivalon calling me out. Players shouldn't be killed for not knowing monsters. Maybe their characters should. Yes, Ivalon, I use players and characters interchangeably at times. My mistake. We shouldn't be killing players ever. Unless. I don't have an unless. Hey. That's all I have. Ivalon, a great point. Flashbacks are another great way to uh, retcon something. Really great way to kind of uh, uh, to put something in. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and I think that's something, flashbacks are kind of seldom done, so I think it's fun to throw something like that in every once in a while. Um, but we, we've spoken a lot about kind of like how players are motivated, and we were talking about this in the context of how to prepare. So let's start talking about what we actually, like, this is, I think, 
me and Jeremy, I think, are fairly close on this, but we would actually prepare for any given situation or going into uh, a session where, you know, there's going to be a lot of choice and a lot of role playing and a lot of exploration, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's it's really easy to fumble, I think, especially for new DMs. You know, the improvisation of this kind of stuff is probably the hardest skill to learn and one of the ones that you'll spend the most time honing. And the thing that I think really starts to, when, when you start to look at a DM's actual skill, uh, that's one of the big things that I think, at least I note, on any individuals, how they kind of react to the unexpected. Uh, and no one is perfect at it, certainly not me. Uh, although I cannot speak for you, Jeremy, my instinct is that it's also not necessarily true for you. No, I'm perfect. <laughs> okay, Jeremy is perfect. I thought it might be the case, I didn't wanna say no, so. Um, and one of the best ways to get around these kind of situations is to know what it is that you want to have. Uh, and here's some like general advice uh, for ways that you can prepare. Uh, for one thing, you want to prepare flexibly. You want to create uh, content for your players that can be just kind of moved around and shifted as you know the story goes on. Uh, be it a town that you know what the town is uh, and, and you have this entire place ready. You don't know when the players are even going to encounter this town. You don't necessarily have it placed on you know, any kind of map that the players can see, but you know that if you all of a sudden need a town, you have this kind of thing in your back pocket that you can just kind of throw onto the board and now you have this thing that you're already familiar with that you can just run with and, you know, presumably you have a little bit more detail fleshed out of this place than several other places that you could have thrown at them. Yeah, and uh, Roger Twy already beaten us to it. The big whip for me with improv is to keep using reincorporation. Yep, I completely yep. agree. Recycle, recycle, recycle. If you have a dungeon that you've prepped out or an encounter that you have planned, just even if it's just a random encounter that you think is going to be really cool, maybe it is a ogre with a bunch of goblins riding on it, and they are the harbinger of the goblin warband that will soon, or but rather, the, probably not the goblin, the hobgoblin warband that will soon uh, uh, go all over the kingdom, right? Obviously, you want that encounter to happen early on in the game as a kind of foreshadowing tool, but your players aren't going out in the forest. Just hold on to it. That's all. You know, you don't have to force it. You can mm -hmm. just wait and let that happen. And when the players go in the forest next time, whichever direction they go, just decide it happens there. Um, maybe like Pete was just mentioning with the town, right? If you've taken the time to prep a town and prep some NPCs or something like that, um, that's great. You can, you do that. And then you just reincorporate them the next time the players go to a town. If they don't go to the town you were originally planning. Um, I know one thing that I really like is you can create a couple of NPCs when you're creating a town and maybe make a few that have some interconnections. So maybe there's uh, the, the miller and the miller's son, and the miller's son is friends with the, uh, the undertaker of the town, and they're good friends, and you have those three characters. The undertaker, who's now a character in the town, uh, who, the gravekeeper, whatever you want to call him, uh, the miller and the miller's son. And those three characters... You might have planned to put them in a town with some other characters, but you can just take them and put them anywhere. You can just have those three characters as kind of a, a slot in to help flush out a town. Until the players ask, is there an X, Y, or Z in the town? It doesn't matter. You can say, yes, there's a big windmill in the center of town, and if the players never bother to go into the windmill, you don't have to use the Miller's son in that town. Yep. There's just an anonymous blank you know, flat-faced, nothing NPC there yeah. until they go to interact with them. You can have a whole slew of characters that you can just put wherever, um, that you can just have ready on the side for, oh, they're going to go talk to a barkeep? Well, I've got this barkeep. They can go to the tavern, and if they never bother to talk to the barkeep, they just want to spend night, don't bother to waste an NPC you flushed out if you have no real use for it, and you're, you know your players aren't going to bite or aren't really interested. 
Um, I like Bionic Shiva's comment here is pretty funny. Oh, that dungeon seems to move to whatever town we go to. Maybe we should just clear it out. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, I think, part of the trick of what Jeremy is talking about, which is once you have kind of established something, then it becomes a little bit harder to recycle. When you tell people that there is, you know, the goblin dungeon of Barak Kool, uh, Barak Cool is not a good name for a dungeon, don't use it. Uh, but um, if you've kind of said that already, if Barak Cool, the goblin dungeon, appears in the next town, well, then that's a little bit suspicious. Um, but as long as you haven't made any statements about someone, uh, it's safe to reuse all of this stuff. Very much in the way that we were talking about last week with improvising in combat, the way that you can just kind of adjust things like strength scores last minute on individual monsters to change their to hits. Uh, but once you've decided on a to hit to once, you have to maintain and use that consistently. And, and an interesting thing about that, right? Pete says, as soon as you mention the town, the place, the dungeon, the threat, whatever it exists, well, you can always describe it vaguely, right? Oh, yeah. You can just say, rather than saying goblins are attacking merchant, are attacking merchant caravans in the forest, and then every freaking town people go to, oh, there are goblins attacking merchant caravans in the forest. I see. It's a goblin infestation. No, you can just say merchant caravans are going missing in the forest. And that's your adventure hook to players discovering Barak Cool. But then in the next town, we'll say they didn't look into the, the merchants going missing. All right, maybe graves are being exhumed in the local graveyard. And the goblins are exhuming the graves to eat the, the bodies. And there's your play in to Barak Cool, right? Mm -hmm. You just have very vague, but like very different and exotic plot hooks that kind of tie into the same deal, especially with the graves thing, because they immediately think, oh, necromancy. And then when it's not a necromancy, they're like, oh, this is even more interesting. Uh, well, I'm already into what Farfil's coming up with in chat, uh, Barakul, the moving dungeon. <laughs> like, I, I, I like oh. that idea. Um, uh, I, I really like that idea in that your because I picture that situation where that happens is you have made a mistake and have described Barakul in two places, uh, and then you use your sort of... Uh, your improv you, technique. Indeed. To when your players go, wasn't that in the last town? You go, yeah, it was. Pretty weird. And now there's a quest hook there. Uh, and now there is Barakul, the moving dungeon, which is something that I'm now very into and will probably use at some point. That um, is another another thing that kind of ties us into just continuing the 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 kind of um, off the rails we're going at the moment. Whenever a player calls you out, right? Mm -hmm. If a if a player has the balls, the cojones to call you out on reusing content or something, roll with it. If they say oh, yeah. wasn't wasn't there goblins in the last town? Yeah, yeah, there were. Yeah, that's they're always right. the answer. Is just and especially they, if they're right, just yes. And, and you say it like that, right? You say it like, yeah, there were. Really seriously, you just look right at them. And they, oh, are there really that many goblins around here? And your answer is just not usually. And right now, you're alluding to a plot hook you haven't come up with yet, but the way that you say it makes them say like, oh, crap, guys, we should figure out why there are so many goblins around here. And that gives you time while the players discuss to think in your head, okay, what is this actually going to be? Maybe there's a goblin horde, right? Now we're going to come up with a goblin horde. And, uh, and suddenly, in the same vein, that player yeah. now feels special for figuring out and noticing these things that you were hinting at very clearly. Uh, Which very you definitely clearly. were hinting at. Completely. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, so... As a little bit of a um, as a little bit of a catch-all piece of advice, uh, a thing I want to talk about is a method of preparation which I call the laser pointer method, uh, in which you would liken yourself to a human lording over a party of cats, running them around by your tiny little laser pointer, uh, and. The way that I personally incorporate this is because, you know, if the players are moving into a new space or a new town or a new territory, uh, and they're apt to want to wander around, explore the space a little bit uh, before they get to whatever, you know, major task, whatever thing that brought them there, uh, it is that they're doing. Uh, 
you can prepare a couple of things in more detail that you can just throw at your players as they start to wander, or as they start to get off track, or if they start to feel like they don't have much direction. Um, and I personally, uh, I think that it's a good idea to prepare two of these sort of things. I think it's good to have one for uh, one for a wilderness situation and one for more of a you know settled environment. Uh, and these are just adventures that can you know, entice players, uh, bring them into a moment, and then curve them back around to whatever it is that they were original, originally doing. So as a, just a, a rough example of what I mean here, uh, to get more specific, let's say they're, you know, wandering through, uh, let's say they're wandering through the wilderness, uh, and they're getting a little bit lost, they're getting a little bit bored. Uh, if there's been a couple of nights of them just kind of camping around. Uh, they're not sure if they're even going to the right place that they're going, just have a nice ruin or a nice dungeon that they can just encounter. Uh, and once they go into it, depending on you know how long and how much of this thing that they have is prepared, um, use elements in that dungeon to tie back into whatever it is that their current quest is. Uh, if they get into it at the end of adventure, you have a whole week to think about how that dungeon, presuming that you play every once every week, which is I think probably the most common, once every week, once every other week. Um, you have a whole week now to think about how this new thing that you, this new element that you've added is going to tie into things at large, but you do already have a lot of details about it figured out so that you can just toss it in and get your players back on track. Yeah, and another thing to note is you sometimes you don't, well, not sometimes. Whenever you're trying to get players back on track, you can't let them feel like you're trying exactly. to get them back on track. You don't want them to feel like you're forcing them into a certain plot hook. Especially if you're providing, like, especially if you're playing in an open world kind of sandboxed game. You don't want them to feel like, all right, well, we decided to go investigate the burbling swamp, and suddenly, oh, there's a hobgoblin fortress here, where we just intentionally ignored the hobgoblin fortress. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but what you can do, right, is you can have maybe, you can introduce something to make the players want to deal with those hobgoblins. Uh, like, um, like we were talking earlier with character motivation. Maybe there is a ruin, like Pete came up, in the barbling swamp the players decided to go. And the players go into that ruin, and they find, you decide, what are the things that motivate my players? And you decide wealth, specifically magic items, right? Power magic items. That's what they mm -hmm. want. And you can just decide, knowing my players like magic items, okay. On the ruins here, you find ancient text engraved into a stone tablet, hidden away, clutched in the arms of an ancient skeleton. You just decide, and on this tablet, which they decide they want to, oh, we want to read it. Oh, it's in a very old dialect, but you could probably decode it over a short rest with an intelligence check. Uh, and the players are like, oh, I want to know what that says. So they decide to do it, because there's no danger. To them. And... Great, you have them roll their intelligence check. No matter what they roll, they succeed, unless they crit fail. Unless they crit um, fail. That's the illusion of, yes, there's a DC, there's not. You can still have them roll. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with having a player roll and then just giving it to them no matter what they get. Um, um, especially with the way proficiency works in this edition. Like, if you're proficient in something... And, like, your party wizard is, at like, a minimum of seven or eight on that arcana check. They're not going to fail. You yeah. just say, oh, it's an easy DC. DC eight. Mm -hmm. They can't fail. You know they can't fail because you know that they have a high intelligence and are proficient in charisma. So, boom. Easy. And that tells of magic items deep beneath. They go looking for those magic items, and that's where they run into the hobgoblin. Yeah. Right? The hobgoblins are also, also looking, looking for, them. for the magic Yeah, items. exactly. Yeah. And now the player's like, well, shit, these guys are stealing my magic items. Or maybe they've already left with the magic items, right? And they're just a couple of scrappy little goblins hanging out. And this is like a really cool way to make your players hate your enemies. If they hate the nemesis, they want to kill the nemesis. So that's just another way to kind of tie it in. I, yeah, I can't imagine anything a player hates more than seeing an NPC get a magic item that they yeah, thought they right. were going to get. Um, yeah, 
Uh, and you can do similar things with, you know, characters and towns, but it's all about kind of, you know, very gently guiding. Uh, and, and the best time to use these kind of things is in moments where you can tell that your players are starting to feel like they're fumbling about. Uh, if your players are stepping with confidence everywhere that they go, they know that they want to go to the Burbling Swamp. They're very clearly excited about the Burbling Swamp. Uh, and you're ready for the Burbling Swamp, then yeah, just let them go there. You don't need anything in that kind of instant. These are the kind of things that you want for times when things aren't going as planned and people are confused about what it is that they quote unquote should be doing. Um, yeah. Exactly right, and that that ruin that has magic items deep beneath with the tablet clutched in a skeleton's arms that can be anywhere. It can be in the burbling swamp. It can be in a forest. It can be up top oh, of yeah. a mountain. It, who cares, right? It can be it's, in the underdark. You just toss it. You just toss it anywhere, and the you change know. can be. Uh, the change to make it fit to whatever you're doing, uh, like, oh, it's at the top of the mountain. Uh, the walls are coated with frost and a heavy layer of snow uh, sits on top of the ramparts versus in the burbling swamp where part of the uh, part of the wooden palisades on the outside of this place are decaying and, and rotting as they are sinking slowly into the swamp below. And then there you go. It's now part of the environment. It's It's like that easy. Yeah, I highly recommend, especially if you've got some more uh, adventurous kind of players, which we're going to talk about in a second, to figure out what motivates the player. And if what motivates their player is what their character would do, think about what their character would do and what their pl the player would think their character would do. They know their character better than you do, and don't be afraid to ask them what oh, motivates yeah. your character. Or what, mo what do you want to do? Do you want cool magic items? Are you more interested in fighting big monsters? Ask them. If uh, someone's playing a very religious character and that's a big part of what they are finding enjoy enjoyable in the game is my cleric of Pelor, perjurer of darkness. All right, cool. Have a, just come up with a church, uh, like an old temple that is destroyed and desecrated where the graves in the back have been raised as the undead, but it's abandoned right now. And just have that. It can be wherever you want. And when the players start getting too off kilter, throw that in and mention, yes, you, there's a trail leading away. And that trail leads right back to where you want them to go. Right? And it's something that will deeply motivate the character. And you can come up with some, like, visceral imagery, right? In oh, yeah. Like, say, yes, there's a big stained glass window that is shattered to pieces and refracts the waning sunlight. In, uh, yeah, you know, right? You can come up with some cool visual imagery for these random encounters or whatever you want to call them, random redirects that uh, can really mean a lot to players and to characters. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's been some cool uh, comments in chat. Yeah, a lot. Um, we, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff. Uh, we have Raventail Blackstone. It's also fun when they walk the opposite direction you want. Uh, if they're supposed to find something, you can always move that something to a new place or some kind of small sign or object that teases them and ties it back to where they want to go. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, she mentioned, uh, you guys go to this tower and kill the lich that's been wreaking havoc uh, as the DM's goal. And then uh, they're like, oh, there's a sunken ship. Let's go check it out. And then you just put a token with a sigil of the lich on it somewhere within the sunken ship. So even though they're not necessarily going and doing the exact thing that's like this big kind of cool story point that you've planned, you're tying in these other kind of minor things you have to begin seeding these ideas and to start kind of, you know, kind of make them want to do the thing that that you think is cool. Because if you can't make them want to go and kill the Lich, then you can't force them into it at any time. It's all about kind of making the Lich seem exciting and important. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. And in a situation like that, you can take it even a step further, right? Let's say that sunken ship and you're like, oh, what the hell? Well, you stop for a second and think, right? What do my players want? They want power. That's their, what their, we decide that's what their motivator is. Take the next step. Why did the ship sink? What well, was attacked, probably, or maybe there's a storm. You can decide. The next question: What was the ship carrying? Is this a ship of war? Because if the players find out the Lich has warships that are now out and about, that was a much stronger motivator. Is it a merchant vessel? Maybe there's a tablet on there, which is like kind of some arcane receipt of sorts 
where if they brought it to the Lich, they'd get paid for the cargo of the ship or for a service to ship render. And now they have a motivator to go and see the Lich, not just to kill him, but like maybe to That's do That's an interesting business. idea. Yeah. And then later, you know, they get betrayed by the Lich and they're like, all right, now we want to kill him. He screwed us out of this money that we should have got that we stole from that <laughs> ship. This, this money was rightfully stolen. Yeah. It, putting these neat little hooks in there can be really neat. can be a, a lot of fun for players. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, go over a couple more things that have been said in chat. Uh, Max Meister saying an improv tip. Uh, when you have players go to a location, put a good reward in it. No reward makes them stay until something happens. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with that. There should always be some kind of thing that the players get out of anything that they do. Uh, even if it is... Uh, even if it is minor, even if it is just the appreciation of the people that ask them to do it. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's also good for them just to, you can always find a way to sneak in a little bit of gold, uh, always find a way to sneak in some kind of cool magic item uh, if you really are looking say, to do so. And If if you're not going to provide a reward, be very clear why there isn't a reward Yeah, for the for work sure. they've just done, right? It's because XYZ stole the reward. Because the hobgoblins were just here. Because, yeah. you know, the enemy you want them to go and deal with stole their reward. Right? Yeah, this a, is a quest in itself could be a reward. Yeah, oh, exactly, right? Maybe they find a treasure map, and that treasure map brings them to a place where they conflict with members of the opposing force you want them to fight. Everyone you can loves always a treasure map. That. Uh, but yeah, some other great comments in the chap, uh, chat. Uh, Bionic Sheep is saying, just throw in a bunch of notable locations and figure out what it's supposed to be as they make their way there. I think that's a great idea, personally. That's a, a really cool way to say it. Just come up with some locations, maybe one or two key identifiers about them. So, the city of Waterdeep. This is a very topical point. Ooh. Your players have no idea what Waterdeep is. Just say, yeah, it's a, a, a big trade city, point one. And it's known for its gigantic stone statues littered throughout the city, point two. W what do you mean giant stone statues? Oh, I mean, they're just towering stone statues. Everyone's heard of the towering stone statues. They just are just standing throughout the city. And the players are like, oh, that's kind of interesting. We'll check it out later. And cool, you don't have to worry about anything else about Waterdeep because the players don't care. <laughs> yep. They might also say, there are giant statues. That's probably cool. There's probably a reason for that. Let's go see right now. And I gotta go you know, library. Listening to how the players talk about the places they want to go can give you a great idea for what, what their expectations are. Yeah, if it's clear what their expectations are to a, for a certain place, it's fine to just adjust a place to fit their particular expectations. Like if yeah. they, um, if they just offhandedly like you just offhandedly mention a stone statue and then out of nowhere they start going, oh, Waterdeep, I hear that place is absolutely filled with huge stone statues, which maybe it wasn't to begin with, but there's nothing wrong with just saying, yeah, for sure, because that seems like they're excited about it. Why not just put those kind of things in there that you know that they are interested in? But yeah, I, what I was getting around to is what Chiba was saying, I think, when you're going to create a bunch of places, especially for an open world game, or a sandbox game, think of one or two identifying features, and that's it. Don't worry too much more. Maybe you can think of what are the general motivations of the people who live here, right? What do they generally want? But don't worry too much about making tons of NPCs and flushing out all of the little shops in the town. Don't worry about that stuff until the players decide to head in that direction. Yeah. And maybe... Think of, like, an encounter that you think could happen there that uh, you could use to kind of slow them down. Most people meet for three to four hours every couple weeks. Every week, every two weeks, every month, whatever. In those three to four hours, they go to a place, they have a couple encounters, and then, you know, whatever. Yep. Right? You can kind of slow play them a little bit. You can give them some... So in the city, right, have an encounter planned for if they go to any city that you're not ready for and that encounter is just guards at the gate stop you. 
because mm-hmm. they want to search your stuff. And most players will be like, no, absolutely not. At the very least, that's a social encounter that'll take them some time. At the worst, it becomes a combat encounter and they leave or do something different. I don't know. Um, and, and really think about the specifics of your party, because, of course, you'll know your party better than we could possibly just you know theorize thinking about it. Uh, think about the exact things that you know are going to come up for them. For example... One of your players just had their armor eaten by a rust monster in a recent encounter. You know they're immediately going to go to a blacksmith the next time they hit a town. Uh, So make sure you have a blacksmith prepared. Uh, There are, you know, just think about the exact things that you know your party's going to do, because there's always things that you know your party's interested in. And asking your players what it is that they're planning to do when they get to a place is also totally fine. If you end a session in the woods outside of a town... Um, you can just at the end of that session say to your ask your players, what are you guys planning on doing in the town? What are you looking for out of it? Uh, they probably won't find it suspicious, even though that may sound a little bit suspicious to you, and they'll just tell you everything that they want to do in the town, uh, and you can properly prepare for it. Yeah, I mean another great kind of one-off, ready-to-go kind of encounter if they go somewhere you're not expecting, especially if it's a settlement, right? Which is requires almost the most work to prep. You can just have your offhanded guard, which this guard, you can name them, whatever, the guard captain. They belong in any city, wherever you decide to put them. And they are chasing and kind of like exhaustedly leaning against a tree, yelling into the woods for bandits to come back. You know, come back and face the law, (laughs) villains, or whatever. And those bandits like kidnapped a bunch of children or something. Pick something that would be meaningful to your players. Look at their motivations. Oh, they want gold? The bandits stole, they robbed the bank. If you catch them, we'll give you half the gold as a reward. And that's a great distraction to immediately veer away and chase the bandits. Yeah, I was just going to say, I love that that's... time to prep, you know. I love that that's just, hey, come back later. (laughs) Yeah, maybe maybe there are trolls besieging the gates, right? You can go with a million different ways as to, they're there, but they can't get in yet because of reason. Um... I see Ivalon asking, uh, pointing, or not asking, commenting. Uh, my favorite bond I once had was one that a DM never really used. It made me sad. Uh, I sold my soul to the Archfiend Balfagor for magical power oh. and knowledge. Interesting point about character bonds. Your dungeon master has so much to think of at any given time. Your bonds are something they probably don't have in the fore of their mind. They might, but they might not totally reasonable to um just kind of jostle your dm in the direction that you want them to go if that's something that you're interested in uh and you want to be in the forefront of the gameplay as a player you can just kind of for one thing just remind the dm out of game every once in a while that like hey this is something i'm interested in want to see played out more and also in character just talk about it uh i mean talk about how you want to go find these different locations and go to libraries and visit you know magic shops things like that i mean and even as as a further thing right you don't have to even be quite so blunt if you really don't want to you should i think you should be clear with your communication with your dungeon master be blunt fine yeah um but in that case say like all right well my character sold their soul to a to an arch devil and there have been no repercussions for it can i sell more things to arch devils for even more power you know ask your dungeon master so i did this once that's kind of my bond it's my character's backstory how can i do more and become even more powerful because there have been no repercussions so far and your dm will say oh but there have been repercussions like oh okay like what well and be like and you know you're giving them the the ammo of hey give me repercussions i know like this is i'm voting against myself here but I, I want to see this going to be fun. But this is the yeah. what's going to be fun for me. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I see Ivalon invisible walls in video games. That's exactly what the trolls at the gates are, or anything like that, right? The guards in front of the noble's home. Um, that's exactly what they are. They're, they're invisible walls, camouflaging those invisible walls, so your players don't even think of them as that. They are just an obstacle that makes sense in the world. That is how you create an immersive and engaging i know uh, yeah. uh a personal one oh, 13 in chat is very good at that very very good at camouflaging walls um 
a personal favorite of mine is uh, if I have a town that I'm not ready for, I like to just have a house burning down within it and people crying out for help within. Uh, and that's almost always uh, people are, heroes are interested in diving in and rescuing people. It is the most like classically heroic thing and people really like to live that one out. So that's just my own kind of back pocket. Uh, yeah, the, the first house is burning down. There's smoke pouring as you approach the village. Uh, and it gives players also a very clear kind of motivation and action as they move in. And stuff that is clear is really good in D&D. &D. Um, kind of, you know, the mysterious figure that kind of leans and eyes the characters suspiciously as they're entering in does not make a great invisible wall because the players are just going to probably pass by that guy, you know, give him a second glance maybe. Um, but they might not necessarily interact with them as opposed to something like the bandits or that fire, which are very clear interaction points. Exactly. Uh, now, sometimes you're going to have that player. Well, sometimes you're going to have problem players, players that just kind of make things difficult. And there are really two types in related that are related to this. Um, the first one isn't really that bad. They're kind of harmless. They're the wanderer. I guess you'd call them. They're the kind of player, or maybe it's just their character, but in the game, their character, they just, they just don't want to stay in one place for too long. They don't want to spend weeks in the town that they just bought. You know, the players all pulled their gold and bought a house. And that player is just like, I want to go out and just explore what the hell. And then they go wandering off alone in the city, like in the sewers. And it's just like, well, what happens, right? How do I deal with this? Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple ways. Um, the first one, I think, is to have a talk. All of your players together, players having a talk about what they want to do, right? Um, maybe there's some time skip uh, downtime activities in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Something you can do to help make the people who want to hang out in the city happy and then get back to adventuring to make that other player. Um, other times, players just don't know what to do besides that, right? They're just kind of confused. I yeah. recently ran into that problem in but uh, as Pete was kind of mentioning, the laser pointer trick, right? Having those diversions. Um, yeah, those are just really have good a couple of back pocket. Getting these players back on. Yeah, just having something fun to just kind of throw at that, uh, just having something fun to throw at that wanderer and just be like, oh, I was looking for something to do and you had it for me. Great. I'm sat like, I'm satisfied. Usually that'll like tide them over for a while uh, and then they'll get hungry again. But for a time, you'll be good with something like that. Um, and, uh, actually, uh, before we get to the next one, I want to point out Raventail Black Talon's comment here because yeah. I think it's really good. Uh, basically, don't put any emphasis on something you don't want them to invest investigate. Do put some emphasis on things you do want them to investigate. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, that is a, a really succinct way of putting it, and I think that's absolutely true. It's all about the way that you phrase things uh, and the way that you place your emphasis and how you just present information to, a pl to players has a huge impact on what they're interested in and what they will want to do. Uh, well, as an addendum to that, if you've put no emphasis on something like very little emphasis on something and the players are really interested in it. Like they just are keep, they keep pushing this random like passerby. So the, the town, not the town crier, but like the doomsayer in the middle of town is like, Oh, the forest will attack. And it's just, you know, they go to talk to him and there, and it's, you just say, Oh, well, he's obviously insane. And the player's like, Oh no, but I'm really interested in this forest attack thing. Great. That's what you're going to prep now. You're going to prep yep. the fucking forest. Oh, yeah. Listen to your player. If they're really interested in this random thing that you meant to just be a joke, that's like, okay, there's a crazy guy in town. Great. That is now your story. Switch gears. Don't be afraid to switch gears. You can always come back to your hobgoblin. You can always come back to X, oh, man. Y, and Z. I have a, an example of that exact thing where I had a bunch of adventure postings on a board uh, because players wanted to go to just an adventuring guild and, uh, you know, just find some quest. They wanted to take, like, a yeah. traditional quest. Uh, and I put, like, seven of, them on, seven of them on there, and I prepped all but one that I did not think they would take. Uh, and the one was there was a lost cat with a reward gold of, like, 20 gold. 
Uh, and that was the one that they were completely dead set on. Uh, and I was just like, oh, my God. Uh, but money. I made an adventure for a cat. Uh, um, and they had a lot of fun with it. And that was what they were into. So that's sometimes what you just got to do. Even if you don't want to have a lost those, cat, you got to listen those to the bizarre, players. Those bizarre adventures, right, tend to be the ones that those wanderers get really hooked on. Cat's gone missing. Ooh. And, you know, maybe you can do that laser pointer. Oh, the cat's gone missing? Oh, well, let's go search around the guy's house. Oh, he last seen up in the tree? Let's go climb up the tree. Oh, oh, interesting. His collar, uh, the, the jingly bell from the collar is torn up. And, oh, no, you see him up in the tree. Down by the opening into the sewer system on the side of the road, it's his collar. And that the of intrigue the unravels. Counter that you had planned, right? And then there's the ooze encounter. Jerry, that's exactly what it was. It was an ooze encounter. The cat went into the sewer. That's Actually, funny. Anyway, yeah, that's right. what I ended up doing with it. it Holy a... sh Pete, we same wavelength, man. Yeah. Um. Anyway, anyway uh, it wasn't all those. Kind of, yes, please. The second kind of problem player, um, and that is the player that delights in setting you off, in catching you off guard, in befuddling and confusing and frustrating you. That wants to think not my character's outsmarted the bad guy but i have I, outsmarted yeah. you the dun dungeon map and that kind of player it, there are a couple situations uh circumstances that player in the circumstance where everyone's just at the table you're murder hoboing around you're not really you don't really have a big overarching story there's not a lot of super in-depth character role playing that player's fine you know yeah. sure fun and whatever but in a game where people are trying to take it really seriously the player's an asshole yep because they're really it can be extremely disruptive to you trying to give everyone the attention that they want in a game where they're role playing a lot um and a lot of the time that's not something that you can fix there's no special magical um impro improvisation technique to help you deal with that player yeah. that's just you sit down with the player and you have a heart to heart of like look dude or or chick or whoever look look brah this look, is the ever look, this is the everyone brah look my friend look yeah exactly look my friend i have a concern with the way that you're acting and you talk like an adult and there's not anything that substitutes that yeah Ask them why they want to play, yeah. ask them what they want out of the game, and if it doesn't align, then that's the kind of person that maybe you just, when it does sometimes yeah. have to happen, you have to kick out, you know? Uh, and don't be that guy. Uh, yeah, and that's all. Yeah. Um, and as one last uh, kind of point, uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to say, uh, Bionic Shiva, you working out your problems with words, just yes, I know, Shiva. No, I know. no, with rods with rods be, be correct that's, in that case that's gross, gross. uh gross, I believe that's gross i think there's like uh, a nice sustain on that essence and then there's one more ah, agree to disagree e w w w w anyway Jesus. Um, sorry uh, there's one last category is we only have like a minute left that we want to talk about and that is what you do in a situation where none of this holds up where all of your players are in agreement and they're being reasonable and they're going at something that you just don't have anything prepared for and there are a few things that you can do you can do you can use stall tactics which we've already talked about a little bit uh, but I think you get the idea something else comes up that you are prepared for that holds them off so you have time to prepare um, even if it's like something very small, if they decide they're going to go to the Lord's house, well, maybe the Lord's butler is really snotty and is going to take a very long time to get you an audience with the Lord. Um, just anything to buy yourself moments to think about what it is that you want to happen. Um, also, if you go online, there are tons of cool resources, uh, tables to help you make things up on the fly. Uh, other people have put a lot of work into these, and there's no reason that you shouldn't capitalize upon their effort and hard work. Uh, things that allow you to roll for stuff like NPC names that you need very quickly, and then like some interesting details about them, like uh, this NPC 
his father was murdered and he's seeking vengeance. Uh, and you now just have a, a new kind of tidbit of information about this random character you had to generate. Uh, and if you're using those kind of random generation tables, keep in mind that you don't actually have to roll like they suggest. You can just pick out stuff that you think sounds interesting. Um, and another tool is when all else fails and you just have to just speak and make things up, uh, my own personal strategy is to just kind of try and discover what's happening through my own speech and as I go. Uh, for example, Jeremy, throw me in a bad space that I have to make something up for. All right, Pete. So you are in the middle of a town oh, and no. you're a wizard and you're like, ah, I cast, I'm sorry, you're a sorcerer and you cast, I cast magic missile. You cast magic missile and as your wild magic surge, because you're wild sorcerer. A giant portal to the abyss opens up, and your barbarian's like, we need to get out, and tackles you into the <laughs> abyss. You're in the abyss now. What okay, happens? excellent. I love this. Um, so to begin with, I would take a very long time describing uh, describing the actual <laughs> transition of the portal itself. Uh, you see before you suddenly a tear in space. The air begins to... <laughs> Are you laughing at? I can't write to read whatever that was. Um, okay, uh, a great tear in space begins to open. You watch the air begin to ripple and crack, and then suddenly a great green circle, a uh, wavering and shiny, appears. Uh, and then, as they're kind of thrust through it, I would take a long time. You seem to fall for what seems like hours. Uh, and I would talk about how time seems to drag out as they're like crossing into the strange place of the abyss. Uh, and as I really kind of lean into uh, this idea of like time distortion and uh, this kind of unsettling bit of journey, I would describe how they feel. They just kind of can feel the evil of the place, how it kind of sits on their skins, the hairs on the back of their arms kind of stand on end. Uh, and, while I, and while I do that, uh, I'm trying to think of what actually is in the fucking abyss. I'm going, oh, sorry, I swore. I'm going over every <laughs> single thing in the back of my memory uh, and being like, oh, God, what even is the abyss? That's like the demons, right? Oh, yeah, um, labyrinth. Baphomet has the big labyrinth. You're in a maze. And then I would put him in Baphomet's maze is the first thing I thought of now. Uh, and there then I would go. just describe a long corridor. And... That, that was time incredible, to, actually. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, but actually, but time seems to drag out for hours, just like this speech. Indeed, that's the trick, is you just really try and bring them in with just the words, uh, and then you have now, time to think about what you're actually going to do. What Pete just did is something that, like, Pete's very good at. Pete has practice with this. That's why it works. It doesn't always work. And True. I think the most important takeaway... And I think our final point, besides Raven Tail's comment, which I think we'll read after, um, our final like major takeaway here should be sometimes playing a game and something completely that you actually could not have expected happen, which is very rare. But when it does, it's okay to just say, we need to take a break. I need to figure out what the fuck just happened. <laughs> and it's totally fine. You can do that. You can tell your players, let's take a 15-minute break, run down to the store, get some snacks, maybe do whatever you need to do. I need to get a handle on this. Cool. Yeah. And it's totally fine to do that. But that is if really If something cool. truly bizarre happens, be square with them. There's usually not a need to throw yourself through the mental hurdles of figuring it out and of digging yourself into a hole that you don't want to get out of. Um, and that's cool. That's totally fine. You know, you can do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Now, that's all. That's all we practice. got. That's it's practice it. on that kind of stuff. When you're in those situations, uh, I said it before, those are the fires in which you are forged as a DM. Uh, and those are always, uh, I don't know, I, f I personally find that kind of stuff a lot of blast. And I find those things that your players do that you never can account for, that's one of the true joys of being a DM for me. Jeremy is one of those players that does those kind of things a lot. Anyway, uh, I just want to call it one more because it's a really great point from Raventel Black Talon. Uh, made one shot once. And this is notorious for one shot, so I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, our dungeon master had to flat out deny a murder hobo's attempt to murder another NPC. 
the player wanted to kill her first at her fourth story NPC, and the dungeon master was just like, "No, sorry, you need to stop for a second. I get that you want to kill everything, but realistically, unless you were a deranged psychopath on a murder rampage, you wouldn't be doing this. Your party's trying really hard to do something here, and I get that you want to have fun, but you're just making everyone else really frustrated." Great DM. And it's that excellent DMsmanship, first of all. Yeah. And second of all, especially in a one shot, if you are going around doing your best to halt the progress of the one shot and stop the one shot, you're a dick. You should mm -hmm. reconsider how, like, think about what you're doing, how your friends that you're playing with think about you, and think about how they're going to continue to feel about you. Because I can tell you, the answer in my book was would be, I wouldn't want to play with you anymore. And if you're thinking that your actions are going to make your players want to not play with you anymore, you know, your other, not your players, but your other, you know, the other people in your party, that should be a red flag. <laughs> because yeah. that's not what you want to do. <laughs> you don't want to be doing things that make people not want to play with you. And it's easy. It's just taking that moment to step back and look at the scenario and think about it. But anyway, Absolutely. I just I needed to share that because that is the an excellent way to handle that. Uh, it's great to do that um, during a break if it's just one player being bad. But sometimes you just don't have time for that shit, right? It's a four oh, yeah. story NPCs in a one shot. Like that's oh, a lot. That's ridiculous. That's where you need to stop and be like, like look, nah, -uh. that ain't what we're like doing it, here. Cut it. We all came here to play Dungeons and Dragons. Where's your buy-in? Uh, but anywho, thank you all for the awesome comments and chat. Uh, we got we, re we definitely ran a little woo on this one, but I guess that's fair for improving. Right? Considering the nature of the topic, indeed. Uh, um, last comments uh, we have uh, Farful mentioning uh, yes and as a great tool. Uh, yeah, I I mean. I definitely agree. Matty Morg's yes and and no but are powerful tools for improvisation. They certainly are. He also mentioned that he thinks it could be its own topic, and yeah, you're probably right about that. Um, I think a lot of people take whole classes and years to master that particular idea. Um, but perhaps Pete it's and I are but simple that. plebs when yes. considering. Um, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Now, that's all we got. Matty, you're in chat right now. Uh, hit me up. Let us know. I believe. You're going to be streaming shortly. Matty Morgs is another uh, Dungeons and Dragons content streamer here on Twitch. Um, he streams almost, I think, every night, right? Holy crap. I, don't, I can't handle a schedule like that. But Matty is more powerful than a bunch of simple man like myself. Indeed. Um, and I'm not sure what he's going to be covering tonight, but he's done a lot of really cool stuff lately going over the Pathfinder um, uh, kind of beta that's out, going over Ooh. the Dungeons and Doggos expansion. I'm sure you've all seen the Kickstarter. Um, I'm not sure what you're doing tonight, Maddie, but let us know. And yeah, he's also doing a cool uh, fundraiser for his channel that involves buying Dungeons & Dragons minis. Um, I love minis. But if you want some minis, head on over there, throw them a couple bucks, get some cool minis in the process. It should be a ton of fun. Um, yeah, I know I'll be hanging out, yeah. so hope uh, to I think see you all there. I will actually be as well. Uh, I'm going to come chill. So Pete's going to come uh, chill, guys. I'm it's also going to be. It's, it's, that's all I got. Um, <laughs> another thing, uh, this is a thing that we've talked about uh, a little bit, me and Jeremy. Um, it's also a recommendation we've gotten from a couple different people at different times. Uh, but as an idea for talks, uh, we were talking about doing a segment uh, at the end of talks where we just every week, you know, collect some questions from people and then just uh, address a random particular question that people have, uh, whether it be just some anything relating to D&D, uh, whether it be advice, uh, a particular scenario from a game that you're running that you would uh, like, you know, some some outside opinions on or anything like that. Um, and we're probably going to start it off pretty light on the subject, but sometime in the next, before the next talks, uh, we're going to put out like a form for that or something. So if you're interested in having any kind of question or anything like that answered or just submitting any ideas in that way uh, maybe we can also you know set up you know talk submission ideas because i'm sure that some of these questions will make us want to do whole talks about them uh yeah. so uh we'll One do that sometime that I will say, next though, week. look out about it we're gonna set those up 
when we do set those up, they're just going to be a big old bulk list and Pete and I will randomly pick questions from them and yeah. then we'll answer those questions. We're not going to keep the same questions from week after week and let them pile up because we don't want to be answering a question about a campaign that ended like yeah. six months ago if you know we yeah. get a lot of back. It'll so probably be the question on refresh. Those, make sure to... uh yeah, comments and stuff. Oh yeah, random characters. That's a really cool one. And I, I love Maddie Morgan's idea of cracking oh, yeah. open a box and then whatever minis are inside, we have to make a story for. That should be interesting. Might be hard with Dragon Heist because there are a lot of named in people. But I guess just by appearance, can change their name, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, thank you all for hanging out. Um, I hope you all had a great time. I certainly did. We will catch you all Friday for Pete uh, and Jeremy's D and D time. Nine o'clock, be there or don't be there. It's up to you. It's a low commitment game. <laughs> um, I am Jeremy. And I'm Pete. And this and is D&D &D &D Time, Time Talks. Time Talks. Good night, everyone.